So it's somewhere. Hello, and welcome back to the Blue Lineage podcast series. On today's episode, I'm going to talk about one of the most influential and uh, popular blues artists, at least uh, in modern times, um, or recognized in modern times. Uh, during his time, he was not necessarily in the popular music scope, but today, not only for his music and sort of lore and legend around him, uh, he's, he's very well known, and that is Robert Johnson. Um, but before I get into that real quick, um, just a reminder, you can follow along on the blue, bluelineage.com. Um, there's a timeline section that uh, illustrates where we're kind of at. You can find Robert Johnson and some of the artists for this episode. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily follow any uh, specific order. Or the timeline doesn't break down who who's covered in which episode. Um, if you look under the podcast descriptions, it does say which artist is covered in some of the topics. And then, of course, there's the clips on YouTube as well. Uh, the clips are helpful if you if you can't or don't want to listen to the full episode. Uh, there's specific short, shorter clips. It doesn't necessarily cover everything about the artists that I talk about in each episode, but it definitely gives a breakdown. Uh, so there's that option as well. But I think the time timeline is uh, specifically helpful just to kind of keep everything in perspective. Um, so, so far, we're basically crossing into the 1930s uh, before everything was pretty much pre-1930, even though some of the terminology and events we talked about kind of continue uh, through through the 1930s and beyond. But uh, that's no done timeline and probably was mentioned in the episode. Uh, so, as I said before, Robert Johnson, very uh, well-known musician. Um, a lot of people look at him as one of the most popular Delta Blues musicians. We talked about Charlie Patton last time, who was definitely a big time, uh, pretty well-known Delta Blues musician, maybe even more well-known as far as pop music goes uh, during his time. Robert Johnson was really not discovered till after his time, as far as the popular music scope, as I was saying. Um, but locally and among musicians, he was known uh, during his time. And as I'll mention later, uh, just very influential. Um, he doesn't really carry some of the titles that the other musicians had, like uh, Godfather of the Blues, you know, King of the Blues. Some, you know, a lot of those are kind of self-titles, um, almost marketing tools. But a lot of it was just because he wasn't uh, necessarily recognized, and that's one of the reasons why there was so much legend and lyric surrounding him because so much of his life is unknown. Um, but for example, the first photograph of Robert Johnson didn't emerge until sometime in the 1980s, and I believe. I'm not sure when, but just recently, not that long ago, there was a a third photograph, which is, there's three total photographs that have been, like, verified that are of Robert Johnson. So that kind of tells you the limited information uh, surrounding his life. And at this point, like I mentioned with some of these other older artists, it's hard to say if anything else will come out. Um One of the uh, things that characterized Robert Johnson's music and also built on the lyrics is that his music had a very dark character, um, a dark sense. A lot of the lyrics were pretty dark, which is not too outside of the realm of Delta Blues. You know, it was a, a rural music that really um, discussed some of the hardships and difficulties that the musicians and the communities were going through at the time. And a lot of that was expressed in the music, not always, not necessarily. And even for Robert Johnson, it, it wasn't, I think it may have been a little bit overplayed and kind of just played into this whole narrative of Robert Johnson and this darkness and his dealings with 
the devil and the crossroads and him selling his soul, which is, I'll get into a little bit more, but that is what he's really well, well known for, um, at least later on. Um, and one of the reasons people said that is because early on in his career, he played with Sunhouse and uh, suppose he had some encounters with Willie Dixon. I mean, what, Sunhouse and Willie, uh, uh, they played um, together. It was well known. I, when I talked about Charlie Patton, Sunhouse was one of the people who was influenced and played with Charlie Hat Patton a bit. And so that kind of follows that lineage to a certain extent. But when Sunhouse was playing with Robert Johnson, Robert Johnson was just kind of getting started playing, maybe some doing some backup work and just trying to get involved. And at the time, he was not, according to Sunhouse and others, he was just not up to par or he was just playing in a way that just did not work with their music and at least in, at that in their perspective it was not uh quality or good playing and so uh he you know quickly left that scene and that would have been when he was in mississippi uh in his early early playing days and then the reason it kind of builds up is when he resurfaces all of a sudden he's a really good player and uh, we'll talk a, a little bit more about that but as far as his character um, and dark character, you know, there are definitely, I think there's truth to that. Uh, but um, if you listen to one of the more recent interviews by his stepsister, um, her last name is, I believe, Anderson. I forget her first name. But she kind of really, it, it, was, it was really recent within the last five or ten years, I believe. She's 94, so... And it's actually very fortunate that we were able to get um, that kind of information at this point from someone, one of his relatives, later on. And one of the things I, that she meant to influence it was just some of the older narratives that she did see of portraying him in this kind of dark way, trying to kind of fulfill this legend about him. And she kind of adds a little bit of the other side where he's a little bit more joyful. The photograph he's in is a little bit more... It wasn't necessarily joyous, but it wasn't kind of the kind of the dark kind of uh, really stoic uh, kind of pictures, uh, subdued pictures that were out previously. But she says that you know he was a, a much more positive, upbeat individual, and counter to a lot of the ways portrayed in movies and in the picture a lot of time he liked to dance and move around in his performances which is kind of counter to counter to the way he's portrayed is kind of just sitting on the on the stool or chair and just playing uh, smoking like a cigar cigarette i think is usually what what goes on and singing from there and kind of playing this eerie sort of crossroads delta blues music um which definitely there's, I mean, there's songs that definitely reflect that, but that kind of adds another narrative. And there are songs, like I think when you think about Sweet Home Chicago, there are songs that definitely play to something else than, than those, uh, those other songs that illustrate that narrative. But at the same time, if you look into some of Robert Johnson's history and how his life was shaped, you know, his stepsister also doesn't really deny or try to say, oh, you know, this other stuff, some of this other stuff didn't happen, but she wanted to add this, these other components. Um, because when you, when you go back, um, his first wife, uh, there was like a tragic story where his first wife died in childbirth uh, well, giving birth to his first child, both of them died, and I think you can imagine that that was, you know, could right, that right there could have contributed a lot to his playing style because this was really before he started to, before his transformation into a good player. So that would have definitely shaped a lot of it. He 
was known for drinking a little heavily. So a lot of the stuff can all play together, you know, in various forms of trauma. And it's not like far off to think, oh, this is what shaped maybe some of his writings or his character, or if sometimes he was a little bit down. Stories like that could definitely do it. And I think another one of the reasons that that could have been downplayed is because as a performer, um, as an entertainer, touring around, he was a well known or known to favor uh, married women, relationships with married women. So I think if you kind of have that reputation or people inflate that reputation, maybe that can take away from the relationship and that early loss that he experienced with his first wife and child, which definitely could have shaped it. Um, another interesting thing actually about in regards to that, I have to look at my notes to get this, this straight because it's a little bit confusing. But his, he was born, when he was born, his mother, he was born to his mother and another man. His mother was currently married to another individual and they remained married, but the guy she was married to um, was, he had, he had to leave uh, Mississippi and go to Memphis due to some other kind of conflict that was not you know, related to them. And so eventually his mother and him moved to live with this guy in Memphis, well, her husband still in Memphis, and her husband was with another mistress at the time and so they all lived in that situation for a few years until eventually his mother left that situation and remarried to another man and he eventually went to live with them as well. So you can see how you know, as far as modeling and marriage and relationships, how that kind of got a little bit convoluted and different. So that could have changed how you viewed marriage too. So that's just, you know, kind of side stories. But, you know, I think it's important to consider some of these things when, especially going backwards to those times and the way um, black life may have been portrayed. I think with a lot of these individuals who weren't well documented, some of the lore and legends, when you think about how black people were, described sometimes it becomes you know very almost mythical but very um it's 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 very flavorful and a lot of fiction and lore is kind of thrown thrown in there consistent with some of the things that were said at the time that weren't necessarily positive and not necessarily true may have taken a few instances, extreme instances, and expanded those and used those to color a lot of different individuals uh, in, a, in not a great light. And in the case of Robert Johnson, I think, you know, his stepsister put it well as far as, you know, not necessarily disagreeing with some of the stuff that's out there, but also adding some of the stuff. And I think that's the case for Robert Johnson and some of these, some of his legends and dealings with the devil, even though, you know, f even for me, you know, sometimes I like don't completely dismiss it, but I generally would subscribe, ascribe to some of these other more um, grounded stories that have come out. So, so Robert Johnson, after, uh, you know, the tragedy with his first marriage, um, he traveled around a bit and he ended up going to southern Mississippi where he where he uh, was tutored and met um, Ike Zinner, Zinnerman um, and Ike Zinnerman is known to be his primary mentor uh, during this period where he was really focusing on guitar and another component of that was he got remarried to a much older woman, woman. Um, I mean you know, comparatively older, um, by I think like 10 years or something. And she was very supportive of his music career and 
you know, really allowed him to kind of explore that and also being mentored by Ike Zinnerman. And one of the one of the things that kind of, I guess, contributed to Lore, I think, to some degree is um, Ike Zinnerman was rumored or known to enjoy playing, practicing guitar late at night while sitting on tombstones. So that's kind of a interesting detail. I think, you know, if you want to think about like the whole devil narrative, like, oh, this guy is, he's playing, uh, learning from this guy who likes to stay in the graveyards and sit on tombstones and practice, which is a little bit odd. Uh, but, you know, I think in rural life, small town life, uh, certain things are just done differently. And, you know, I think the outdoors is viewed differently. Sitting in the graveyard is a little bit odd, but at the same time, you know, you could also think of it as a, as a spiritual way. You know, if you're depending what your roots are, I think people view that those things differently. So I don't know, you know, but it's interesting. And regardless, he, he, uh, that whole period of time where he was able to focus on music and really practice a lot, and get tutored by Ike Zinnerman, who was, you know, really early Delta Blues man in his own right. Uh, he eventually returned to Northern Mississippi with these new skills and really wild people. And that was that period of time would have been the time where people are saying like, oh, you know, he made a sold a soul at the crossroads and made a deal. And that's how he became a great guitarist, which, you know, it's uh, a little bit of a stretch, I think, but I don't want to completely, you know, dismiss it. And, you know, if that's the, I know he's famous and well-known, so I don't want to, you know, if that's the narrative that you like, you know, stick to it. Uh, so as, after that, you know, that's when he, his career began, began and he began to tour, uh, mostly based in like Northern Mississippi and Arkansas, and he he started to travel a bit more through like the Midwest and you know, all the way through uh, um, I think to the East Coast also Northeast Midwest Northeast the kind of the the usual uh, route um, that people would take the time moving up the Mississippi and heading east at some point. Um, and, you know, he influenced quite a few musicians at the time. Holland Wolf, Holland Wolf, who was also a big, uh, was inspired by Charlie Patton, uh, Sonny Boy Williamson, Elmar James, you know, pretty well-known uh, blues musicians who, you know, came, came up shortly after. Um, and so, you know, just, I guess, dig digging a little bit more into the legend of Robert Johnson and... The Crossroad Blues, which was one of his first hits, when he, so he he uh, he never really got discovered by the industry. He was, he toured around, uh, gained some popularity. He definitely was known by, you know, other up and coming musicians. And the main the main uh, success or commercial success, industry success, they got uh, got him two recordings there's only two known recordings professional recordings of him and they were both done by uh, ARC which is the American Record Corporation and it evolved into I don't I remember if it was Columbia Records I want to say but regardless it was in Texas that one was in Dallas one was in San Antonio consecutive years one year after the other and he recorded uh, the basically the only recordings that are known of him. Um, they're not the greatest recordings. Um, I one of them was done in the makeshift studio, so I'm not sure. It wasn't a mobile unit. I th you know, I think it was. Uh, there are other people, other artists who recorded there, so I'm not sure what quality it was. But you know, if you listen to the recordings, they're not great in comparison to some of the other recordings at the time. You know, nothing was. You know incredible at the time but they don't sound as good as others um and so one of his his hits 
is Crossroad Blues, which was re- later uh, reworked and is Crossroad by Eric Clapton. You know, it's one of the the big ones. Um, but the Crossroad Blues is what people really point as as to emphasize the legend of Robert Johnson and the whole deal with the devil. Um, but if you listen to the the song Crossroad Blues, uh, there's definitely alternative interpretations and and not, and also in uh, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so he's if you listen to the song, he's really alluding to feeling uh, unsafe or you know uncomfortable in a unknown area at the crossroads of a major a major road highway and you know you have to go consider the times this is you know the 1930s so in in Mississippi and as a black man you know being in an unknown area where people don't know you uh, this is during Jim Crow laws, although in Mississippi, a lot of the Jim Crow laws, they don't, they didn't really, basically Jim Crow laws were not ne- necessary in Mississippi just because it was already very, uh, not a, not a, it was unnecessary. There's a lot of, uh, okay, so for example, I, in Mississippi, during the Jim Jim Crow uh, law era, there were uh, 539 lynchings, which was the most, you know, compared comparatively among states. So, and so basically, what what I'm trying to say is the Jim Crow laws weren't necessary because there was already forms of enforcement, local enforcement, that were going on uh, to oppress and you know control black people uh, during that era um, so anyways that also that point also illustrates the potential feelings of concern that Robert Johnson would have had standing at the crossroads um, in an unknown area where the either you know, the police can come or somebody can come along and question what you're doing you know, feel fearful or, you know, they're going to put you in jail and put you to work, you know, or worse, you know, that's almost a best case scenario. Um, you know, if you're encountering certain people in Mississippi. So, so, you know, that just that alone, um, would explain what he was getting at when he was talking about the crossroad blues. Um, another, another example I think you can get at is, um, you know, I think when you think about if he, if him preferring married women was indeed a fact or true, then you could see like, you could see that. Uh, him being concerned about you know just those actions can can see how he, he, it can, can lead to him being concerned about uh, being encountered or you know dealing with the devil or kind of like devil's work playing with fire type scenario and and uh you could also just, you know, some people have a very historically spiritual uh, connection with crossroads, uh, depending what your what culture you're coming from. Uh, the col- crossroads are can be a big component in their spirituality, specifically. Uh, I know specifically referring to um, some uh, some spiritual connections uh, that. Crossroads is uh, 
used a lot or language equivalent to crossroads in like West Africa is used a lot. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Obviously there's a lot of, a lot surrounding this song, you know, a lot is unknown and he's not there to, here to explain it. So it would be speculation, but I think, you know, any of those could kind of provide an alternative to the legend that kind of goes along with that song. And specifically, you know, he, Robert Johnson himself doesn't ever make reference to making a deal with the devil. Um, that actually comes much later on, like much later, I think in the 60s or somewhere around there. And, and I think it's actually tied back to Sunhouse when Sunhouse, since, you know, he, Robert Johnson died very, you know, young, Sunhouse is an influence on him and also outlived him by a good amount and so he was interviewed later on and i believe that it's tied the first reference is tied to sunhouse just because of how fast robert johnson improved and at playing it was unbelievable and i think he made an off kind of an off uh just made a quote not really sub subsequent interviews when then people try to bring it up to him again, he didn't really, he didn't really emphasize it. You know, it seemed like it was just, he might have been saying it kind of sarcastically or as a side note, but regardless, you know, that, that really built up. And as you can imagine, if, if he wasn't, if his music, Robert Johnson's music wasn't popularized, pop, popularized until much later on. And of course, um, you know, your first photograph and, and whatnot, is until nineteen eighty, so you have popular music, people are influenced it, so now they don't even have a face to put put uh places to or attribute it to. You can see how like the legend can kind of get out of control, but you know, this is this is this type of thing isn't un uncommon, I guess, for some of these earlier people who don't have histories, a lot of stuff is filled in, they fill in the blanks in a way that was um I guess uh consistent with some other lure and talk that was common back then but I think Robert Johnson is one of the like, most uh, famous examples just because everything kind of fits together when you um, tell the story and it's exciting and there's a lot of blanks to be filled but regardless when you're just talking about his music Robert Johnson um some of his songs, like Crossroad Blues, as I said, picked up by Eric Clapton. There's also I'll Believe I'll Dust My Broom, Love in Vain, which is uh, Rolling Stones, I believe. Uh, Stop, Breaking Dawn, Stop Breaking Down and, of course, Sweet Home Chicago are all songs uh, originally created by Robert Johnson and maybe Alter, or some of them are essentially were kept preserved and became hits down the road and and it's and interesting some of those hits are really you know rock well blues rock and electric blues type hits so it's interesting as we're getting closer to or longer uh, later down the road towards the end of I guess the uh, peak of Delta Blues, um, we're starting to see some of these innovators and prolific players starting to develop songs that are used in what are labeled as different genres to some degree. Uh, all those, all these songs are definitely heavily rooted in the blues, even down the road, as you can see. But you can see how, you know, Crossroads, for example, is you know a pretty rock song. Um, if someone called it a rock song, you wouldn't disagree. But if someone called it a blues rock song, you know, because it has clear ties to blues, you know, that would be valid also. So you can kind of see how I think. And even if you listen to his Sweet Home Chicago version, you can hear that you know, Sweet Home Chicago, which is a pretty uh, rock infused hit later. You can still see that even though I think the tempo is definitely slower, uh, it it definitely resembles that that song later on, even though he, this is Delta Blues, so it's a solo, it's still a solo performance, but 
you can definitely hear the similarities. It's very clear. Um, so after Robert Johnson, moving on, there's another very, uh, and actually the last um, Delta Blues musician on this list. As I was saying, we're getting towards the tail end of this kind of era of Delta Blues. Not that it goes away completely. Um, there were still Delta Blues, mus there still are Delta mus Blues musicians today, you know, but as far as kind of shifting on the timeline towards uh, different sounds in a different genre, uh, these, these guys are, or even, well, there's still electric blues. There's still blues players on the list. But as we're starting to see other genres appear on the timeline after this. And and I think what's interesting about this next artist, Tommy McLennan, is that both uh, Tommy McLennan and Robert, Blonson, Robert Johnson, as we're going to, as we uh, I just mentioned, and Tommy McLennan, both of them have songs that really speak to the next or next few uh, innovations or evolutions in the timeline. Uh, whereas Charlie Patton and Blind Willie Johnson, who, and Charlie Patton specifically, I, I mentioned Spoonful, Spoonful Blues, which was adapted later, but it's, a, it's a definitely a much more of a stretch and some of their music was used a little bit down the road, more down the road, but more specifically, Charlie Patton and Blind Willie Johnson really influenced that next generation of of blues players who were also Delta Delta blues musicians or you know kind of country style blues musicians, kind of staying within that more strict blues genre. Um, whereas Tommy McClellan McClennan and uh, Robert Johnson really influenced, I think, rock and electric blues sounds that were probably more cons more consistent with uh, the urban sounds and later. Um, and I think it kind of speaks to where the music was headed, but also that music was evolving towards kind of trending towards this the entire time as it sort of evolved you know but all these artists went touring they went to uh, urban um to cities to record uh so that and there's that there's an exchange happening as i kind of discussed earlier on you know to a certain degree early blues was kind of almost created in a vacuum to to an extent and then evolved into an urban uh, sound and subsequent subsequent genres or sounds, innovations, evolution of music uh, all was was centered in urban areas, which is consistent with the Great Migration, which we talked about, and probably I'll mention again because we're getting close to uh, what was called the Second Migration. But anyways, for Tommy McLennan. He, I just mentioned Robert Johnson's hits. He was, Tommy McLennan was known for like Catfish Blues, Crosscut Saw, My Baby's Gone, New Highway, Number 51. And once again, I think these songs are definitely more blues oriented when you think about Crosscut Saw and, uh, and what else did I just mention? Crosscut Saw, of course, uh, well-known out by Albert King, um, Catfish Blues, you hear it from Muddy Waters. So a lot of these songs are definitely in the electric blues area. And that makes sense because Tommy McLennan, who is definitely not uh, hugely well known, but when you look at his, some of the, his original songs, it's pretty, his catalog is pretty impressive. He's really known for his vocals, um, he originally learned also from kind of that Charlie Patton lineage. He played with um, Booker Miller, who was um, a protege of Charlie Patton. And when Booker Miller stopped playing um, in Mississippi, um, basically um, Tommy McLennan grew up mostly on a plantation in Mississippi where he encountered 
uh, Booker Miller in that same area. And Booker Miller, when he stopped playing, sold his guitar to Tommy McLennan. And shortly after, that was when Tommy McLennan started touring. And he ended up uh, recording in Chicago. He was recruited to record in Chicago. And that's basically where his entire music career um, occurred, which was not very long. Um, as I'm going to talk about in a little bit, his his music career basically started in that when, in 1937 when Booker Miller sold him that guitar and ended in 1942 when there was a strike, which you can see on the timeline during that strike between 1942 is a musician strike. I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more specifically in a moment, but not many record records were recorded during that two year period. And so in 1942, he stopped recording and, you know, he's impacted by that and maybe something else. I'm not, there's not a whole lot of detailed history about him, but after he, you know, he didn't record again. And actually he was, the last time he was seen was in like, uh, like a homeless community in Chicago. And shortly after that in 1961, so it was ways down the road. He was, he passed away from bronchi bronchio, bronchio pneumonia, bronco pneumonia. Um, so not, not a whole lot known career was pretty brief, but made a major impact. He's really known, like I think I said, for his really expressive, ferocious vocals. And, um, you know, if you get a chance to listen to his recordings, he's, he, uh, definitely has, a a very unique sound to him and was a hugely influential innovator, even though he's not super well known, uh, even, even today, but definitely deserves a lot of recognition. And so as, as I was alluding, alluding to, um, the strike, the 1942 strike was led by the American Federation of musicians and so a little bit of background about that just as as relevant to the timeline that's what I'm going to post also on the website and the terminology I'm not going to really get into the whole history of the American Federation of musicians um, just kind of a brief background as it's relevant to the timeline so going back backstory going back to the early days, earlier days of the American Federation of Music, I'm actually going to start talking off by James Reese Europe. So if anyone's ever heard of James Reese Europe, he's a little bit more well-known in like the jazz community. Um, but he um, originally grew up, uh, he was actually a neighbor of John Philip Sousa, and one of the reasons I want to bring up this whole situation is because it's kind of an important element to the early jazz and ragtime and and some of and it gets connected to some of the people that we've talked about early in the timeline and it kind of all connects back to this strike. So so John Philip Sousa, um, if you all are not aware. He was the creator of a very popular form of marching music. He was also the creator of the, like the, the tuba, the, like the marching tuba, I guess it's called the sousaphone, where it's like the people like put it around their like neck and play it. It's obviously he's a marching music creator and a popular marching music creator. So we wanted to, include the tuba so you create a tuba or help he crop create it um and and it's also significant because john uh, philip souza was a early his marching music was a huge huge component of ragtime ragtime was is essentially influenced by his marching style and incorporating African so uh, African influenced like polyrhythms and uh, beats and you kind of get and you get eventually get ragtime and ragtime 
with um, some like blues components is what jazz is. But I think jazz is uh, right time definitely more heavily influences jazz than some of the blues components. And so, so all right there you have James Reese Europe and John Philip Sousa living right there in uh, the D.C. area, and. And so that was a big influence on John Reese Europe. He kind of got into that and the re- the early ragtime sounds, and later he got into jazz. But his his sound he's got he was well known for a, mostly for being a composer. He did uh, he was a band leader also, but I think his compositions and the sort of ragtime more emphasis though on the on the um, the rhythm aspect. He's really known for syncopated music, and his music was really composed very often for like thea- theatrical dance performances. Um, and and so, actually, one of one of the connections is at one point. You know, we talked about W. C. Handy. One of the connections is. At one point, he was leading. He he was working with a white dance group or team, white dance team, um, at the time when W. C. Handy released Memphis Blues, and they actually uh, James Reese James Reese Europe actually wrote or helped create uh, a. It was like a dance routine or dance step, a foxtrot, popular as a foxtrot to go along with the Memphis blues. And it became really popular. Um, and so that that's really what he's well known for is these uh, several uh, compositions that were used in musicals, created to go along with dances, um, a really... Uh, a pretty big game changer in in that area of black music at the time, um, and and jazz. What eventually became jazz. Um, but the other component of James Reese Europe and why he's relevant to the strike is because he was such a prolific black musician at the time. Remember, this is during around the time where we were talking about W. C. Handy and some of these other early musicians where there are very few opportunities for black musicians and entertainers to operate independently. And of course, in jazz and the ragtime, there was less resistance. That's one of the reasons why W.C. Handy was able to do what he did, is he was in a slightly different field playing ragtime music, but then incorporated blues from you know what he had heard and learned and brought that into the limelight, a spotlight, and popularized that to a certain extent, brought that into mainstream music. Similarly, with James Reese Europe, he was playing a form of music that was, you know, a little bit, was well accepted and popular at the time. And he was able to use that to really um, build and change the way music's musicians were able to be compensated and compete in the music business. And the time... The American Federation of Music was segregated. Uh, this was um, in 1910. Uh, he created the Clef Club, which also was coincided with the Clef Club Club Clef Club Orchestra, which was um, what he he ran that also. And the Clef Club was, you know, all black musicians and they got to the point where they were competed enough with the American Federation of Music where the music that they had to desegregate in 1914 which was a huge victory because all of a sudden you know the Clef Club obviously was doing well to compete with it but also to, to do that to the American Federation of Musicians meant that the, that that union would have to acknowledge black musicians in a similar compensation and provide similar bookings to black musicians, which 
you know, just was not occurring before that at the time. So that was a really big vic victory, and it was uh, as led by James Reese Europe. And actually, uh, another interesting and pretty unfortunate story, actually, about James Reese Europe is that um, upon his death, which is so somewhere around, I, th I believe it was 1919, but you know we can look that up or you can look it up. Um, but basically, what had ha what happened is they got a dispute. He was at a, he was at a performance. It was between shows or after an act, and one of his or two of his drummers, he was having a conversation. He was up with, upset with them and he was kind of scolding them, or you know just saying they weren't doing something right was a uh, kind of a one way to s dispute it was James Reese Europe kind of yelling at or being uh but in other words that the drummer felt disrespected and he ended up uh you know throwing down his drumsticks as legends has it uh, he threw down his drumsticks got dispensed his drumsticks in some way and he had a pen knife and he attacked um, James Reese Europe and stabbed him in the, I think the back or the neck. And at the time when that happened, they, everyone there thought, you know, the wounds were superficial. I, you know, he was going to be like, oh, I'll be okay. You know, just, you know, you know, keep the performance going. But he ended up actually dying later from those, from that injury, from that wound. And what's interesting about that is if you watched uh, this recent movie, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, uh, that came out this year, or maybe technically last year, now it's technically 2021. Um, you, you know, Levy's character uh, at the end of the movie stabs the band leader. Um, and in, and in that one, it was a little bit more dramatic, where he basically died on the scene. But what's interesting about that is, um, from what I understand, and at least to my knowledge, you know, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is, you know, based on a play, and the events in the play are essentially fictional, even though collaboratively or together, they do depict the day in the life of Ma Rainey, and you know, some of the dynamics of the industry. But, you know, unless, from what I understand, and, you know, if someone has other information, you know, please send it my way, because, you know, I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, learn about that. But from my understanding is, you know, the, considering that those events as a whole are fictional, you know, it, it, it seems like that scene could have been based on uh, what happened to James Reese Europe, getting stabbed by one of his um, band members or orchestra members and then succumbing to the injuries down the road. Um, so that's just an interesting, I don't know, speculation, uh, which I found interesting or find interesting because that kind of coincides even though they're separate. It's in the same time period, sort of. Uh, when you think about Ma Rainey, who was very early blues musician and you know at the time of his death which have been 1919 so it's kind of like these events would have occurred around the same time so you know it's something to think about and consider um but regardless a very you know unfortunate loss um um but fast forwarding forward, forwarding down the road to the American Federation of Musicians. And so due to the success of James Reese Europe, you know, we have an integrated American Federation of Musicians. And in 1942, the president at the time, James Petrio, he uh, organized a strike. He led a strike against the record companies at the time to uh, basically in dispute of the compensation specifically to relate to jukebox, jukeboxes for those of you who 
were around then or remember jukeboxes since they're not, I don't know if people ever refer to anything as a jukebox, even if it's in jukebox form or plays music. I don't, I have, I have not seen a jukebox in quite some time. But anyways, that was the core of the dispute is the money people were getting from ju jukebox plays and just the conversation in general. So there's a strike, basically not, almost no records were recorded between 1942 and 1944, specifically by large record companies, but kind of the benefit or perk, not perk, positive at this time was that um, some smaller record companies emerged, and some of these were, a number of them were black-owned record companies, which, uh, which was good for black musicians, and entertainers, but also these record companies reflected more of the music that was starting to take shape, where as as you may have noticed or seen historically or currently in modern, modern times, it can be difficult to shift, you know, the product or the goal of a large record company. They want to kind of stay within their formula until... You know, it's clear that that's no longer working. So some of these smaller companies were able to really adapt and take on some of the newer, some of the newer sounds. That so, and some of these genres we'll get into because, as I was saying, Delta blues, as known, was uh, starting to fade a little bit in the popular, in popular music, and some of these other sounds um, were starting to, to become more popular and dominate, emerge into the scene. And one important individual to mention in this is actually uh, an individual who's actually lived his life much, you know, he's much older than where, than the time where he was actually recognized and sort of contributed to industry. And that was William Champion Jack Dupree. So William Thomas Dupree, also known as Champion Jack, he was a boogie woogie, sort of blues musician Boogie Woogie was is actually is basically as old as a blues um, but it's more um, known to be piano based it kind of has a uh, it's usually faster it's kind of a more dance oriented um, has more of like a rolling uh, beat you know it's something that you definitely recognize if you hear it um, so he was known for boogie woogie and blues, um, and the sound sort of over time evolved into like to what was known as jump blues at the time. But that was later down right down in his career because quite a few life events, as we'll go over, happened before he could ever really become a musician and pursue that area of his life. Um, one thing that of note early in his life. His um, parents died when he was an infant uh, in a grocery store fire. Their grocery store burned down. And according to champion Jack Dupree, the fire was started by KKK members, um, which could definitely be true. Uh, nobody really knows, but there has also been times where he said that the fire just started from kerosene, uh, like a kerosene container that was for lamps, and it just exploded, a spontaneous explosion, and the store burned down. Either way, tragic, and due to this, he was placed in an orphanage um, and lived there, you know, till he was in his teens. And that was where he actually first learned to play piano at, at this orphanage. And then he left in his teens. This is in New Orleans. He left and became 
homeless, mostly homeless. He stayed with some people here and there, and including uh, one of his other mentors who helped him learn more further learn on the piano. But generally, he was primarily homeless until he learned to box. He learned to box as a form of survival on the streets. And then that led to a actual professional boxing career, which he was, during which he, he was pretty successful in. He fought, you know, over a hundred fights. Like he was a, he was a, success, a successful fighter, and that's where his name, Champion Jack, came from. He uh, he won like Golden Glove. I guess it would have been the Golden Gloves of Louisiana, maybe. I'm not sure. I think I'm pretty sure. Actually, no, his boxing career was in the Midwest, so I'm not, I th I'm not sure. It probably would have been the Golden Gloves of either Michigan or Indiana. Um, I'm not sure how, I mean, generally Golden Gloves is state by state. I don't know how it was back back then. That was quite a long time ago. Um, but successful boxer, got the name Champion Jack, and and so he leaves he leaves boxing largely because of the war and he was drafted into the war in 1942 i think it would have been and so 1942 he's in the war he started off as a cook naval cook and then he got in while he was in action got deployed into action he was captured by um, the Japanese army, and he was actually a prisoner of war for three years until 1945, where he was eventually released and returned to the, to the U.S. Um, and actually, when he was captured, he was married at the time, and his wife passed away while he was a prisoner of war. And so, um, I guess one note is before he, he went to war, I think it was 1940, is when he recorded Junker Blues. He, he basically retired from boxing, got his first record deal, recorded that song among others, but you know, right almost right after, you know, he was drafted and then went to war. So he was just about to get his career record career started. Um and then after that he he after the war he lived um I believe he moved to since his war his wife passed away he was living in the midwest and since his wife passed away he didn't really want to go back there didn't really have ties there so he moved to new york instead and he recorded during that time under a ton of names um and it it said that he recorded for like 21 different labels during the time under a bunch of different names and then finally he's at one point, um, he started to just record under his own name for King Records in Cincinnati slash New York. There's two locations. And he recorded there for a few years. And then finally, he just left the United States altogether. He moved to Europe in 1958. Uh, he was just, you know, he was over it, uh, was just had a lot of, he's always, always been very socially um, active, concerned, and so just the, some of the things that were happening in the U.S. did not sit well with him. Um, and in general, a lot of black musicians at the time went over to Europe to start a career just because uh, a lot of musicians found that the Europeans or providing them with a lot more respect and just opportunity and uh, dignity that a lot of black musicians and a lot of black people in general were not getting in the U.S. So he ended up moving there and staying there for basically his whole career, um, remain, remaining career. He did come back um, a few times, especially in the end of his career, to go on some tours and to... You know, for some visits, but primarily he he performed and recorded in Europe, England, Europe. Uh, he lived in Germany for a large period of that time. Um, he in the nineteen you know early nineteen sixties, I guess end of the nineteen fifties. 
he performed with a lot of musicians um, and was, a, I think, a huge catalyst to the blues revival. Uh, the uh, the uh, British invasion of music, blues rock music that occurred around that time just because he was his jump blues style that kind of uh, boogie woogie R&B-esque sort of kind of rocky blues sound uh, matched or went along with a lot of the artists you know at that point this was the 1960s late 1950s at that point rock was already out rock and roll and so it kind of laid the route the groundwork for this sort of r&b rock in europe to kind of form and i mean it already formed in the u.s but it really brought that sound over there and created a definitely a unique uh unique version you know the british invasion rockers sounded different than the American performers to a degree. But as I said, a lot of black musicians went over to Europe uh, to perform over there. So it wasn't like, you know, these musics were, these sounds were created independently. Um, but Chap Champion Jack Dupree was definitely a very inter interesting person. He had a uh, way of words, um, you know, just like um, the tragedy of his parents in general, you know, he was, his his lyrics, he's really well known for the lyrical content in his songs. If you listen to Junker Blues or some of these other songs, he has, he's very slick with his words. And, you know, and, and interesting, it's hard to tell what what is truth and what isn't, you know, just, he's, and not, a, not even in a deceitful way, just in a creative way, I think. Um, another funny story about him was he had this half, this tattoo of a heart on his arm. I think it was his arm. But he had this hat, this half uh, heart, basically. And he had been reportedly sent to prison for, uh, you know, I think maybe 30 days or something like that for stealing oranges, which is, you know. Uh, so he he goes to jail or prison for this and the tattoo artist was um giving him this prison tattoo and what he's his story is you know he only has half the heart apparently um this, this tattoo artist prison tattoo that was getting the artist was unfortunately executed before he finished the tattoo so he only has half a heart which is interesting because it's exactly half a heart so that's the funny part i mean the of this execution is not funny at all but um it's an interesting entertaining story because it's one of those things where you know is it true is it not but um he's a very interesting character someone who kind of gets brushed under um in music history a little bit uh he was well he was more well known in europe so that's one reason it also had a pretty late start to his career um and i think another factor is that he, uh, you know, his career tra trajectory and performing under many different names, you know, he just, it seemed like he was not necessarily somebody, even though he had a, had a personality that was made for entertainment, he was not necessarily someone who I think completely sought that aspect of the industry. So that was, I think, another factor. But Junker Blues um, is a significant song because Fats Domino was, you know, very famous, well-known uh, sort of rock, rock early rock and roll, R and B type uh, player. He, Junker Blues was he he renamed uh, it, reconfigured it a little bit. Um, if you listen to the songs, um, but he called that that's his song, Fat Fat Man. I think is what it is and it's one of his early first hits that he ever had and that was a retooled junker blues created by champion jack dupree so interesting story there and so now so now with champion jack dupree we're kind of getting into this new sort of innovation sound of jump blues moving towards the r&b sound and 
we have Chanting Jack Dupree, who kind of pushed that, and the other person on the timeline that uh, really moves that forward because he not only covers this early sound of jump blues, but if you look at the timeline, Louis Jordan is mentioned a number of times through, throughout the timeline, and he was really somebody who you know, didn't necessarily create the jump blues sound, he, but he definitely helped popularize it, and his band, the Timpani Five, was you know one of the most prolific bands in music history. Um, they actually hold the record for the most days at number one on the R&B charts uh, all time. And so just they just were very good at executing it. They're, they definitely influenced a lot of people, maybe not creating the jump blues, but definitely fueled that shift from jump blues to R&B. And if you get into some of the later um, hits that they made, like Saturday Night Fish, Fish Fry, that is actually one of the first songs where... They use the term rockin' and also where they use a, uh, where someone used an overdrived or sort of distorted guitar sound. Um, it's not really considered rock, but as if you listen to Jump Blues and as you kind of get into that rock era, it becomes really murky about where, where R&B slash Jump Blues ends and where rock begins. Um, you know, generally speaking, you know, like Rich, Little Richard or someone in that area is considered to be the creative rock. Sometimes people say Chuck Berry. You know, in general, it's just murky. But a lot of it is that sort of over, overdriven and, you know, really settled in rockin', sort of rockin', uh, rockin' and rollin' sound, as the name would suggest. And if you listen to Louis Jordan, it's clearly a more kind of swing boogie woogie sort of blue shuffle um you know descendant of a, a big band you know swing sound more so than a rock sound so you can kind of hear definitely where it becomes r&b but not quite rock and roll so louis jordan well as i was saying you know super super well-known famous uh individual um, mostly for a small period of, not small, but less than a decade period of time with the Timpani Five, where basically all his hits were, big hits were created, and then you know, he continues to perform, but that was kind of the peak. But he started as a saxophone player in swing bands, and he also was involved in a minstrel variety show act called the Rabbit Foot Minstrels, and they were well known because... Well, not because, but there were Bessie Smith and uh, Ma Rainey both played in that minstrel band and, you know, kind of covered the history of minstrel shows and all of that earlier on. So I'm not going to really get into it, but that was a well-known act and that was one of the bigger professional, early professional acts he got until he formed his band, the Timpani Five, um, I kind of already went into his style and how it was a precursor of the R&B sound. Um, but another big uh, contribution the Tiffany Five had in, in terms of sound was really taking that big band, um, the big band setup, which was usually around 10 people, and showing that a combo, which is about th usually like three, f three to seven individuals that they could still get that big sound and be a powerful you know commanding act um that, that was really something that hadn't been done for done before in in that area of music or in music popular music in general um and so like i said early on um when they formed I, they formed around 19 uh 39, I believe, 38, 1938, 1939, but they didn't start uh, recording until 1942 um, for their major label. And during that period between 1942 and 1951, 
they recorded like 57 recordings and 55 of those recordings made it onto the chart so it was you know just you know not just made it the charts the top of the charts so they just had a just a really incredible run that uh, no one has really um, you know no one's really top since and popularized popularized the genre and certainly influenced people down the road um, and as I suggested after that um, Louis Jordan didn't really have a super successful solo career, but he continued to perform. You know, uh, you know, did did all right, and other performers, especially in the jazz circle, were able to collaborate with him and you know learn from him um, later on. But um, I think the main songs I, I highlighted in the timeline, like Choo Choo, Jabuggy. Um, you know, they were just not only hits, but examples, each of them kind of exemplified the sound of the time. And if you listen to each of them, as you go down the timeline, you can see how it kind of slowly evolves into, um, into a sort of almost rock and roll sound in Saturday, Saturday night fish fry. Um, and let the good times roll is a good example, pretty classic hit that was covered by a lot of people that sound that shows like that infusion of blues it's kind of a blues shuffle um but with louis jordan it's a kind of a blues shuffle swing sort of style so all the tracks are big you know with louis jordan you know you kind of just there's so he has so many hits you know it's hard to just narrow it down to one but in the case as relevant to the timeline in this case if you go through the timeline and listen to each one in order you know because it covers like i said they they recorded from 1942 to 19, well, I'm, I'm not sure if the last hit was in 1951, but that's when the band broke up. So in between there, you can sort of see the evolution in a short span of time. And in 1950s, of course, was when you start to get into the rock and roll beat. So, so once again, you know, Louis Jordan is not necessarily the creator of a lot of these sounds. Uh, they definitely, typically five, you know, very prolific, definitely contributed to it, it. Contributed to it, but most importantly, they popularized and, you know, at least assisted and supported the evolution, and um, and that was a huge catalyst into the R and B genre. And so, as we can see. Went back to the timeline. Um, yeah, that leaves us at the strike. You can see on the timeline the strike where there's not anything really recorded between 1942 and 1944. At least on the timeline, there were definitely recordings that occurred, um, but you can kind of see that gap. So as you can see. Um, next, we'll talk about Muddy Waters as he moves to Chicago, um, which is consistent with the second migration, which I didn't really speak on yet uh, because I covered it when I, when I covered the Great Migration in the first episode. And the second migration, as you can see, is its label and timeline is 1941 to 1970s. You know, basically 1940s to 1970s, and when people talk about the second migration, usually they're talking about post depression, post Great Depression era, and it was really characterized by people moving from once again people were moving to the north, northeast, but a lot more people in the second uh, migration were moving out to the west also, and they're kind of characterized the first great migration was a lot more about labor labor rights and opportunity um people just trying to you know so everyone's just trying to survive this throughout this whole this whole process and today but specifically um people you know put in the reconstruction era um people were leaving the south looking for opportunity just to just to make a living and thrive, support their families, 
Whereas now, a theme is still that, but now we're getting into the 1940s to 1970s, we're starting to look at rights. And during this time, you'll, you'll see a lot more focus on acquiring voting rights, moving to get voting rights. Um, during this period, obviously, in the 60s, we're getting into civil rights. So, we're, you know, it's a second migration is marked not is marked by the end of the Great Depression, but you can also see some of the the themes and the goals of the people who are moving and why they're moving shift a little bit also. And so this will cover you know quite a bit of our timeline um, into the seventies, and it might come up again, but just as a precursor, specifically when talking about muddy, muddy waters. He was somebody who, when you talk about Muddy Waters' life, people often point out that he moved to Chicago from, uh, I think he's from Mississippi or Memphis. I think it's an M word. I'm blanking right now. Um, But I'll have it right by the time I get to this episode four. Um, So yeah, once again, thanks for listening. Um, You know, we're we're progressing. We're about halfway, about through the timeline at this point. Um, we're start. We're gonna start to shift a lot more to artist-focused episodes, as this one was only had one terminology, and most of the other ones are not gonna have more than one or two um, notes in the terminology. So it's gonna be a lot more artist-centric, which to me is a little bit more fun. We're also getting into different mixes of genres. Uh, from you know, we're gonna get electric blues, R and B. And we're going to tap in rock and roll for uh, for some of these next ones, these next episodes. So it's going to get a little bit more interesting, I think, for me personally. I mean, the history is interesting, but also I think it can be a little bit difficult just because the, his- the facts and the recorded history is so spotty. And it can be a little bit hard to relate to, but, you know, I enjoy it all and I appreciate you all tuning in.